Hello and welcome to Hope Lutheran Church and welcome to our next installment of the sermon series I'm calling Easter Reactions, where we're looking at different people's different reactions after hearing that their Lord lives. Today, it's Peter. And if you know many things about Peter, one of the things that you know about Peter is that he is very bold. And he made a very bold prediction that fell on its face. And with that brought shame, disappointment, regret, and now he needs to look Jesus in the face. That's what we're going to be taking a look at today, to look at our pain, our regret, when we make big promises of God and fail to fulfill. Come, join us. Have you ever called your shot? Do you know what that means? If you ever call a shot? If you call a shot, you know what that means? That usually means that you are about to make a grand promise and you fully expect that to happen, which most people wouldn't expect to happen. For me, it would be like if I was calling my shot right now, my shot is that I'm calling is this is going to be the best sermon I have ever given, best executed, best planned out, and you will also be amazed at how great this sermon is. That's me calling my shot, right? Have you ever done anything like this? Usually you see it in the sports world. In the sports world, you usually have people making big promises, calling their shot, right? I'm about to hit the shot, and I'm about to make it. The, maybe the most uh, well-known athlete to ever call his shot is back in the 1920s with Babe Ruth, right? So the story goes that he was up to the plate in Chicago and he pointed out to the outfield and he pointed and said that the next pitch was going to go over the fence. Well, I'm, I'm a sort of a baseball nut and the more I hear about that, the more I'm learning that that probably didn't happen that way, that we sort of took that, that story and made it nostalgic and made it where that is the shot that he made. Who but Babe Ruth could point over, to the, over the, to the fence, and of course, the next one, it would be gone. Now, the first shot that I can prove was actually happened. That actually happened was back in 1993, I believe, early 90s. And it happened in hockey. Um, as the, they were getting closer to winning the Stanley Cup, the, the final games, the final tournament for hockey, um, the New York Rangers were playing the Canucks, and the New York Rangers were huge underdogs. They shouldn't have even been there, right? They shouldn't have even been in that final game. Their captain, Marc Messier, um, needed something to promote this and needed something to happen for that final game. And so this is what he did. He went out, he got all the cameras he could, all the New York cameras because he was playing for the Rangers, got all the cameras he could, and he promised that they would win the next game. He guaranteed that they would win the next game. And with that, he took no other questions. And if you were uh, following hockey back then, um, the press ate it up. He made sure that on the next day, or that night on the New York Post, this is what was printed. We will win tonight. And it was just those simple words. We are going to win. He is calling his shot. It had never been done before. And guess what happened? Well, that night... They actually won. He called his shot and it fulfilled. Since then, there are many athletes now that call their shot. Fast forward to uh, 2013 at the beginning of the NBA season. There was a Boston Celtic named Jason Terry who was so sure that they were going to win the championship that he went and he got a tattoo and he put it on his arm of them winning the championship of a season that never happened. And guess what happened there? They didn't even make the playoffs. They lost. And you can't help but think after that, what was going through Jason Terry's mind? What was he thinking? He's thinking humiliation, uh, disappointment. Why would I say something as stupid? Shame, right? And so with that, I want to now take a look at one of the biggest called shots ever to be recorded. 
and it was recorded in Scripture no less a long time ago by a man named Peter. I want to take a look at our fourth uh, Easter reaction because as we see Peter today, we see a man who had already by this time seen Jesus with his own eyes. And by this time, he has seen his tomb open, Jesus' tomb. And he is still weighed down with guilt and shame and humiliation and disappointment because he had called a shot. He had made God a promise. And he had failed miserably in keeping that promise. And now he is, even though the tomb is open, he's feeling unforgiven. He's feeling useless. He is feeling like he blew it. And how could he ever want to interact? How could Jesus ever want to interact with him again? And so with that, I want to take a look at this. Um, Peter, as we know, he was the spokesman for the Twelve. Um, you have the Twelve disciples. It was Peter that was pretty much the leader. He would be the one that would speak for the group. It was Peter that was the man with the bold faith. Peter was the only one that jumped out of that boat and said, Lord, let me walk to you as Jesus is walking on the water. Only Peter did that. Peter was the one that said, you know what? I am Jesus' right-hand man, and with that, you know, I'm willing to do anything Jesus said. He loved his Lord with a passion. I want to take you now to the first step in this, his story here today, and I want to take you to what we call Maundy Thursday. Jesus is in the upper room. The last time he has a formal meeting before he goes to the cross, soon he will be arrested and uh, tortured and crucified. He has his 12 disciples with him, and this is his final meeting. And Jesus lets him know this. He says, like we read in our, uh, our gospel account, he told his disciples, Jesus told them, this very night, just so you guys know, this very night you will all fall away on account of me. But for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. In fact, for you guys to realize and know that I am the true Messiah, this is going to take effect, which was prophesied hundreds of years ago. It's going to happen tonight. But here's the good news, Jesus says. I know exactly what's going on. This is all part of God's plan. But after I have risen, what? After I've risen from the dead, after Easter morning, I'll go ahead of you into Galilee. Now, as a disciple you would hope that they would say, okay, I'll, I'll, I, okay, I'll, we'll see you on Sunday then. Uh, I, Lord be with you. You know, we'll, we'll see you on Sunday. I can't wait for Sunday already. You know, it's Thursday night. Bad things are going to happen. He's already predicting it. When has Jesus ever lied to us? When has Jesus ever predicted anything and it doesn't come true? When has Jesus ever shown lack of power? He walked on work. He raised our friend Lazarus. He has fed thousands. He has done all these things. And he's saying he's going to rise again. And he's saying he's going to meet us later that afternoon. Okay, well, um, God's part of the, we're part of God's plan. I know he's going to rise because he said so. Jesus, you know, thanks for the meal. We'll see you on Sunday then, right? That should have been the answer. But Peter is not, well, he's like us. He's weak in his faith. He's weak in his promises. He's weak in accepting Jesus' promises for us. Here's how he replied. Instead of having that trust, he says, um, just so you know, Jesus, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. These other 11, you know, they don't have the heart I have. They don't have the spirit I have. They don't have the faith I have. These, these bozos might fall away because of their weak faith. I'm never going to. I'm never going to fall away uh, because of that. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, Peter. This very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me. You will disown me three times. To which Peter should have said, oh man, I, forgive me. Forgive me for my weaknesses. Forgive me for what I am going to fail to do again. Lord Jesus, forgive me. And Jesus would have forgave him. But no, he calls his shot. He makes a, probably the biggest called shot in the history of human beings. He says, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. I'll go right there with you. Even if I have to die, I will never disown you. I will never turn my back on you. I will never swear that I don't know you. I will never be uh, embarrassed to be associated with you. Never. And all the other disciples said the same. There is the most famous shot ever called in human history. You want to know what that would look like today? 
You know what that would look like for us now? We usually have these same called shots at the beginning of January, right? Let's just give me a couple of examples. Um, for those of us uh, that are married, let's just, let's just pick on husbands today because we had Mother's Day last week, Father's Day is coming up. You hear from your wife that, you know what, um, there's things that you could do better as a husband. And you know what, you say to yourself, this year I'm going to be a better husband. I'm going to be the husband that why my wife needs. I'm going to put away like God asked me to. I'm going to put away my wants, my needs, and I'm going to be that husband for my wife like God wants me to do. I promise, Lord, this is a new year. Maybe you're thinking to yourself, you know, this is the year that I'm going to give my time and talent and treasure the way God wants. I'm not going to give him my scraps. I'm going to give him my best because the Lord loves me Love me enough to make sure that my, secu- my, my eternity is absolutely secure. That deserves my best, not my scraps, not my leftovers. This is the year. This is the year that's going to be different. This is the year that I'm going to go and I'm going to invite that person that lives near me. I know they're hurting. I know that they don't have a church home. I'm going to find a way just to reflect God's light to them. I'm going to find a way this year to do that. Or... You know what? I'm going to fight hard against that pet sin. That sin that always seems to be with me. That sin that I can never seem to shake. I am going to fight against it. I'm not going to give in to it. I'm going to fight and fight hard against it. That's what that looks like. That's us calling our shots. And if we're honest, we're pretty good at it sometimes. There are some times when we fulfill this. And that's what Peter did. Soon after this, Jesus allows himself to get arrested. And you know what Peter does? He he doesn't run off. He doesn't go running for the hills. You know what he does? He takes a Roman soldier's sword, unsheathes it, and he goes hacking. He is ready to go and kill for his Lord. Nobody touches my Lord. Nobody arrests my Jesus. Nobody does that without having to go through me. And Jesus tells him, in a way, this is all part of God's plan. I can't save you. I can't save Dan Ober. I can't save us unless I get arrested, unless I go to the cross, unless I die. This is all part of God's plan. Put the sword away and trust in God's plan. And so with that, now, as you might know the story, Jesus allows himself to get arrested. And he allows himself to go through the sham trials. And while that trial is going on, While Jesus is being accused of things he did not do, in fact, he committed no sin, there is Peter in the courtyard keeping himself warm, fully expecting Jesus to walk out of that courtroom saying, yep, got out of it. All right, fellas, let's let's get out of here. Let's go. Fully expecting them, Jesus, to come out and say, you know what? Um, There's no way that they are arresting God. Just with a look, I, I smote them all. I got rid of them, their existence. Or just, you know, with my power, I just walked through them like I've walked through before. He's fully expecting Jesus to come back out. Gather the troops. Let's go back to work. Let's go for a walk. Well, this is what happens. A woman, a third shift servant girl, who didn't know Peter, but she recognized that he talked a lot like Jesus. This third shift servant girl goes up to Peter and says, Hey, wait a second. Um... In a way, you, you're talking a lot like him. Are, are you with him? To which Peter says, no, I, I don't even know this guy. She says, no, 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 no. You, you, your dialect, you sound a lot like him. Are you sure? To which he says, I, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, scram. I, I don't know what's going on. I don't know this fellow that you're talking about. Twice. Then we pick up our account. After a little while, those standing there with Peter went up to Peter and said, surely you are one of them. Your your accent gives you away. You can't help but talk like this, this Jesus. You're saying the same things. Then Peter began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I do not know the man. I swear to God, I do not know this Jesus. I swear to God, I am not associated with this man. May God strike me down with curses, If I am lying to you, I promise I do not know this man named Jesus. Immediately, like Jesus predicted, the rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the words that Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, Peter, you will disown me three times. And as you can imagine, Peter went outside 
and he wept bitterly. Man full of promise, man who called his shot, man who said, I will never do this, who realized he had failed his Lord. He had had full of promises and now fell short of what the Lord would have him do. Do you want to know what this looks like? You probably know what this looks like. Your promises, husbands, to your wives, you realize that you're still doing the same things. You're not honoring her the way that you, God would have you do. You're not honoring her the way that you have promised to do. You look and you realize, you know what, this past year, I have not given God my best. He has given me his best. I haven't given God my best. I've probably gotten my scraps. You look back on this year and you realize that that person now has not been invited that lives in your neighborhood. You have not reflected Jesus to them like you had promised. And that pet sin that continues to follow you is still following you, and you've probably given up on it. You know what? That's just the way it's going to be. I'm done fighting against it because that's just the way it is. And with that, if you're like Peter and you call your shots and you fail your Lord like that, you're probably going through what he went through. Humiliation, disappointment, shame, even though you know that Jesus lives. Even though you know that the tomb is open, you're still weighed down with the fact that why would Jesus want anything to do with me? How could God even forgive me for me failing to do these simple things that I want to do so very badly? And so that's why I'm glad you're here today, because I hope that you hear again from God that you are indeed are unworthy of his forgiveness. You indeed have blown it. But that's exactly why Jesus came. To forgive the unforgivable. To forgive and be patient with those that fall, like you and me. And so with that now, I want to take you a few days later from that event that we were talking about. It's now a few days after uh, Paul, or, uh, Easter Sunday. And we find Peter again. This time, Peter is back fishing. Now, there's two reasons why this might happen. Why would Peter go back fishing? Because Jesus is the one that went to him and asked him, drop your nets, come and follow me. And, Je and Peter left the world of fishing and became his disciples. Why is he going back fishing? Well, the first thought might be, well, you know, it's probably a nice day, like today. You know, I'm going to go fishing. But that's not the kind of fishing he was doing. He's dragging nets. He's doing, he's doing um, commercial fishing. Why would he be doing that? Well, if I can put myself into Peter, when I have blown it, I feel like, what would God want to do with me? And I'd not have only blown it by lying to Jesus and by uh, dis disappointing Jesus, but I'm unworthy to follow him. I'm unworthy to be put to work. And I'm betting Peter is thinking, that whole disciple thing, I did my best. And obviously I blew it. Obviously he's going to be looking for a replacement. I'm going to go back to doing the thing that I used to do before this. I'm going to go back to being a fisherman and living with my shame for what I was uh, promising to do. Then our account continues. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, uh, said to Peter as they were out there fishing, they look on the shore and they see Jesus. And John says, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. That is Peter being Peter. I want to now go. I want to be by my Lord. I love my Lord that much. The other disciples followed in the boat, like most people would, but not Peter. He wanted to get there as fast as he could, and I'm going to swim there if I have to. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about 100 yards. This is now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he had raised from the dead. This was part of Jesus' tour, showing the disciples, his friends, that he was alive. He never showed it to his enemies, those that rejected him, that he was alive. He always went to his friends to let them know that he lives. And because he lives, they will live for eternity. When they had finished eating, because Jesus made the fish, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. I just want to put a pin in it right here and teach you and talk to you again about the three main Greek words for love. You have eros, from where we get the word erotic. That's not the word that's used here. 
Jesus says the first one, agape, that is selfless love. That's the love that a parent would have pushing their child away so that they get hit by the bus. That's the kind of love that God wants us to give to one another, selfless, like Jesus did for us. And then there's a third, the friendship love of, called phileo, from where we get the word Philadelphia, brotherly love. The, the kind of love that I would say yes to if you asked me to help me, if, if you asked me to help roof, uh, put shingles on your roof or help you move, it takes a kind of friendship love. Jesus says, um, uh, Simon, son of John, do you agape love me more than these? Do you selflessly love the best kind of love? And he replies, Lord, you know that I phileo love. You know that I am imperfect love. You know that I love you, but I can't uphold what you are asking me to do. And for the first time, Peter is recognizing and saying, I'm a sinner. I cannot do what you're asking me to do. I cannot do what I even want to do. Yes, Lord, he says, you know I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Get to work. Teach others. Feed my lambs. Again, Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus says, well, take care of my sheep. Get to work. Take care of my loved ones. Take care of my people. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And then this time Peter was hurt. Peter was hurt because he asked him a third time, do you love me? God knows all, right? And God was there and heard, even though Jesus was far away, he heard and knew that Peter had denied him three times. So now he's asking him three times, do you love me? To which he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. God knows all. God sets our timetables. God knew how Peter would even give up his life so that he could obtain heavenly glory. And then Jesus gave him the best kind of grace, said to him, now go follow me. That's what grace looks like. God giving us, giving Peter a second chance, a third chance to not only follow, but now to go back to work. And so with that, let's transition this to us. Let's bring this and put this in our laps now. You know, when it comes to calling shots, Peter probably gave the biggest called shot that's recorded, but that's not the only shot that's recorded in the Bible. In fact, God called a shot. God made a huge promise way before Peter was even born. And that goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. After Adam and Eve fall into sin, and after sin enters the world and changes everything, God calls his shot. And this is what God promises. He says to Satan, I'm going to put enmity. I'm going to put a block. I'm going to put something between you and the woman, between you and your, our, our offspring. He, future Jesus, will kill you. He will crush your head. But it's going to come at a price. You are going to strike his heel. And with that, maybe the most comforting shot was ever declared by God himself, saying, even though we have fallen into sin, a Savior is coming. A rescuer is coming. He's going to crush Satan. He's going to take away sin. He's going to create peace with us and God. So if you're filling in the blanks, here's the blanks, and here's the, the bottom line of this uh, message that I hope you take with you. Nothing is unforgivable. Nothing is unforgivable with Jesus through faith. Let that just sink in for a moment. Nothing that you have done is unforgivable. That means that God loves you, not based on your past, not based on your abilities, not based on your weaknesses. God loves you not based on your mistakes. God loves you whether you keep your promises or not. That's why Jesus came, to pay for those things even our false and, and dropped promises that we give to God. Nothing is unforgivable. Not the times when Peter fell publicly. Not for the times when we are bad spouses. Not for the times we fall into our pet sins. Not for the times that we give God our scraps. Not for the times when we ignore God. All those things are forgiven because of what Jesus was willing to do for us. And with that now, God gives us a new day. And he gives us a new week. And he gives us new opportunities to honor God through our spouses. 
in the way we treat them. Honor God with the way that we give back to him through scraps or through our best. Honor God by fighting the temptations that he has given to us. What will it look like when we do it this week? What will it look like when we leave here knowing we are forgiven and we now want to put that forgiveness into action? Let's find out. Let's find out this week what that means when we walk with the grace that only Jesus can give to us, that only Jesus earned for you and me. Amen. Hi there. I'd like to take a moment, just the two of us, to talk about what it means when you give back to God through hope and where your gifts go to. You know, this spring season, we usually have a season where we talk about the open Easter tomb and how monumental that was for human history and for your history. You notice that God didn't have the angels spread the word. He had us, we, spread the word. His people spread the word. And one of the ways he did that was to go and, and empower the people and tell the people that their Lord lives and they would go and run and tell people and tell people. Well, that was then and this is now. And I want you to know that when you give to hope, you are supporting our technology here. The same technology that you're looking and we're talking to through. This technology is what allows us to go and preach sermons and tell the news and give devotions not only to people here around Farmington, but all around the world. God has given us this technology and we use a big portion of your gifts so that we can broadcast that Jesus lives. Your Savior, their Savior lives and you help support that. Thank you to all of you that have given in the past. If you haven't given, maybe now is a time for you to give your best gift by following the information on the screen. Either way, we're just glad that we were able to spend some time together today so that we could hear the good news one more time. Thank you for your gifts, thank you for your generosity, and thank you for supporting Hope. Thanks again for worshiping with us. It's great to have you again with us. If there's anything I can do, if I can pray for you, please get a hold of me so that I can be there for you, even though we talk through the camera. As always, though, as you go into your mission field that God has put you in, Lord's blessings, and always because of Jesus, you have hope.